Ready to get started? Well, w welcome to uh, Golden Square this morning. The next one in our, in our series of tech breakfasts, um, as we always say, tech breakfasts are about engineering fundamentals, uh, those kind of things. Whereas if you come to Golden Square sort of later in the day, for sort of afternoon and evening presentations, they generally tend to be about products. So, uh, you know, loudspeakers or, or the current state of Pro Tools, the S6, those kind of things. Um, and keep your eye on, on, on Jigsaw24.com, which is where all these things can be found. Our next tech breakfast is a follow-up to this one uh, in December, and it's about wave division and multiplexing. So once we've all left today, masters of fiber, uh, we can come back in December and, uh, and we'll, we'll talk about uh, wave division multiplexing, how you can put many, many uncompressed signals down a single fiber, and how you can really, um, I suppose, uh, get better value out of your fibre infrastructure, particularly if your fibre infrastructure runs uh, long distances between buildings. Um, and and that's been a, it's, been a, it's been a big seller for us in the last few years, um, uh, providing um, uh, many, many signals over single fibres so that people can kind of reuse their investment. Um, but here's today, uh, fibre optic cabling and introduction. So we'll be talking about um, uh, lots of things, uh, applications within film and TV. That's kind of obvious to us, isn't it? Um, single mode versus multi-mode. If... If that's the only takeaway from today, that you walk away understanding the difference between single mode cable and multi mode cable and their, and their different applications and the fact that they are fundamentally different technologies. If you think about twisted pair cable for carrying an audio signal or a, an ethernet signal, the way twisted pair works, common mode rejection, all that kind of stuff, and the way a coaxial cable works for carrying a video signal, that kind of thing, um, then the difference between single and multi mode is as marked as the difference between twisted pair and coax cable. Um, and, and, and it, it, as I say, if, if that's the only thing you take away today, I, I, I feel that we will have achieved a goal. Uh, we'll talk about the difference between tight buffered and loose tube cable and, and how, uh, you know, one is, is fundamentally suited to some things and the other is, is fundamentally better for other things. And, and that kind of feeds into the pre-made versus spliced cable. And then when we talk about uh, splicing fibre optic cable, uh, my colleague Wesley, sitting over there, um, uh, who is the king of the, of the fibre fusion splicer, um, uh, uh, Wesley Lolos Cyrus is his name. Uh, he'll come and, 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 and run the machine, and you can see how uh, a sort of a current model contemporary core alignment fusion splicer connects fibre cables together. Uh, we'll go, we'll connect the types um, uh, and where you'll typically find those, and talk about some future developments because um, obviously it's a uh, it's, it's 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 an area where our insatiable appetite for data um, grows. Uh, you know, fibre has, has, has been following. So. Uh, you know, the, the first place you probably came across fibre in your career was in a storage area network. Um, uh, maybe an Avid Unity, if, if you can remember back that far, or um, uh, you know, an XSAN, something like that. Uh, fibre attached storage. Maybe not so common now as it was. We've all pretty much moved over to Ethernet attached storage because of you know, the joys of, of compression and, and those kind of products. But uh, uh, storage area networks was probably where you first came across uh, fiber optic cable, and that would have been multi-mode cable, as it's called. We'll get to the differences in a minute. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, for, for most people, that would just have been either a bunch of workstations in the machine room that were extended up to the edit suites with fiber optic cable, probably a pre-made cable, uh, attaching those, the, the, the fiber channel card in those machines to a fiber channel switch, a uh, sandbox or something like that, uh, and, and hence to the shared uh, fiber storage. Uh, or maybe even uh, fibre tie lines running through the facility to, to, to um, workstations that were sitting in the edit suites. But the principle is the same. Uh, but increasingly, you know, the way where we see uh, most multi-mode fibre now is in network switch up links. You know, how you, how you create the backbone of your network. The vertical segment, to use the old expression, uh, and, and you know, as, as things like end of aisle topologies become more common, uh, we see uh, uh, fibre as being the predominant technology that, that enables those kind of network uh, topologies. But it's not just for fibre channel and Ethernet. Uh, it, you know, synchronous broadcast signals, uh, the, the, the thing that makes us money, uh, you know, MADI, SDI, HDMI, uh, those kind of things, uh, you know, we typically extend those over fibre as well. And um, KVM, uh, uh, there are some KVM systems, uh, think logical and things like that, that only work over fibre. But even if, it's a, even if it's a KVM over IP system, a Teradici system, Amulet, the one we we sell and we love. Um, typically, if it's got to go long distance, it's probably going over a fibre extension. And, and as, I, as I mentioned before, we'll talk about wave division multiplexing and the two flavours of that in our December Tech Breakfast and, and how that really brings uh, fibre, uh, you know, extra value. So I banged on a bit about how the fundamental differences between single mode and multi-mode fibre. Um, 
Uh, although the first exposure you might have had to fibre would have been uh, multi-mode fibre for storage area networks, actually the development of fibre was very much, for its first two decades, was very much single-mode fibre. Um, a single-mode fibre has a, a, a transmissive core running down the centre of the cable, uh, which is only about nine microns, nine millionths of a metre wide. And the construction of all kinds of fibre is that you have a transmissive core running down the centre of the cable and then you have a, 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 a cladding uh, that is still made of the same material but has a slightly different optical property surrounding that. So we've got a couple of diagrams here of, 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 of you know, representation of, of, of multi-mode fibre against single-mode fibre. Single-mode fibre, very, very tiny transmissive core down the centre of the, of, the, of, the, of the cladding. The cladding is always 125 microns wide for all contemporary fibre standards, uh, but the width of the transmissive core is what, is what separates single-mode fibre from multi-mode fibre. And contemporary multi-mode fibre standards are all, always 50 microns for the transmissive core uh, sitting within 125 micron diameter uh, cladding. Single mode, again, the same 125 uh, micron uh, um, cladding, but a, a 9 micron core running down the centre of the cable. Um, and uh, single mode cable, you sometimes refer to, seen, refer to as OS1 or OS2. They're exactly the same thing. OS1 refers to um, cable that's, that's ratified for internal use within buildings. OS2, long, long run cable, but it's technically identical. Um, or sometimes you see 9 stroke 125, 9 microns against 125. And that's that's the, the width of the core against the width of the cladding. Uh, the original style of fibre developed... Uh, the original style of fibre developed in the, in, in the late 60s, early 70s by, by British Telecom and, and Corning, uh, Dow Corning in the States. Um, and it's all about the chemistry of the glass. It's all about how pure you can make a piece of, uh, of silicon glass, um, uh, you know, take a, a signal. Um, and and our, the, our, our single mode cable, nine micron uh, transmissive core cable, typically we're running wavelengths down, uh, of, of between 1270 and 1690 nanometers. They're the, the sort of typical sets of wavelengths we run down a single mode cable. And they are, of course, if you, if you came to our, our colorimetry talk, you will know they are well outside the, the, the range of human vision. That's uh, much, much further uh, 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 into the, um, the infrared end of the spectrum. You can't see it. And so when I see people kind of holding a fibre cable and cupping their hand around it to try and see the, the TX and the RX coming out the cable, you're not actually seeing the data. You're just seeing the fact that some um, optics manufacturers put an LED inside the fibre, inside the, inside the SFP, just to light it up for your entertainment. You're not, you can't see the fibre data coming out of a cable. You know, it's just well outside your range of, of vision. Now, uh, that, that little... Um, um, uh, um, uh, equation there, uh, where, where N1 and N2 are the refractive indexes of the core and the cladding, uh, that tells you how many uh, numbers of modes of, of light you can push down the cable, not wavelengths, modes of light, get to that in a moment, um, uh, based on how wide the core is. And so the, 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 the important one is A, the core's radius. And as the core's radius gets smaller and smaller and smaller, the number of modes that can be pushed down the cable uh, goes tens to one. You know, if you put some numbers into that, you'll see that V tends to one as, as A decreases. Uh, and so, uh, you know, th this was understood, you know, for, you know, 50 years or whatever, uh, uh, and it was only really in the 90s when people started to figure out that you could make the transmissive core bigger and hence push more modes of light down the cable uh, that this idea of multi-mode cable was developed. Now, uh, this sort of like rather imposing diagram on the left here is is how those modes are launched down the cable. If we go back to the previous slide, you can see this kind of shows that the different modes of light uh, come from different angles of launch down the cable. And you might think to yourself, well, does the laser inside the SFP, can it physically move? Because I know laser is a coherent light, it's a single wavelength of light. Can it, can it physically move and launch different modes of light down the cable that way? Well, it can't, of course. But what, what you can do with a, with a fixed laser is that you can modulate um, uh, an interference pattern that gives the same effect as launching multiple angled modes down the cable. And, uh, uh, and when you put an analyzer at the other end and look at how those modes pop out, you kind of get these sort of strange patterns. And you can modulate um, many, many, uh, if you think about, if you're familiar with the way DVB works, how, how we encode um, um, uh, for QAM64 or, or QAM256 for digital broadcast, uh, you might remember what, what, what the constellation patterns look like for that. And it's a way of using two, ca t t two indexes to be able to modulate uh, on, onto a single carrier such that you've got uh, m many, uh, many uh, um, retrievable 
and patterns at the other end that, that make up the interference modes of the cable. It's all a bit kind of down in the physics and the, uh, and, and the, uh, yeah, the quantum mechanics of it, really. But suffice to say, that by this very clever manipulation of the interference pattern launched down the cable, you get this effect of multiple modes of light going down the cable, all at the same wavelength. And in the case of, in the case of multi-mode cable, it's typically 850 nanometers. That's where all your equipment's working, if it's working multi-mode. Uh, and, and whereas, in the case of single mode, the light wave is contained perfectly within that nine, nine micron core, in the case of multi-mode cable, we rely on this effect called total internal reflection, where the modes of light bang into the, into the interface between the transmissive core and the cladding and, and, and sort of make their way down the cable, bouncy, 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 all the way to the other end. Um, the limitations uh, of that are, are that, uh, you know, typically, even with the very best contemporary fibre standards, we're topping out at about one and a half thousand metres. Uh, and, and earlier standards, kind of 500 metres was all you could achieve by using multi-mode cable. And, and we, we have this effect of, of, of modal dispersion as the, as the signal runs down the cable. Basically, the distinction between the symbol types, as they're called, just becomes less and less distinct. And it gets harder and harder for the SFP at the other end to recover uh, the data as it comes off the fibre. But hey, for in-premises use, multi-mode cable, that's fine, isn't it? Uh, you know, it's cheaper to manufacture, or at least it was until recent years. It was cheaper to manufacture multi-mode fibre. It was much cheaper to build SFPs that could do it uh, because you didn't need a, a, a precision laser to be able to do it. You could do it, do it with something called a, a, a V-cell, a vertical cavity selective emitting laser, which is basically a solid state. It's, a, it's, a, it's an LED diode um, that you can build on silicon. Um, so here, here, here are sort of our multi-mode standards as they've developed over the years. OM1, literally optical multi-mode type one, uh, you know, came out in the 90s sometime. It's now pretty much considered obsolete. It used a 62.5 micron core rather than the 50 that we now know and love today. And is, it relies on, on the glass being optimised for those vertical cavity selective emitting laser diodes that, that, you, found, that you find in, in, in what, you know, cheap SFPs. Uh, OM2, uh, which is kind of early 2000s, never really caught on at all. I've, I've never seen any infrastructure OM2. I mean, I see it in the catalogues when I'm looking to buy patch cords, but I've never seen it used in anger. Um, and the problem was that it was, it was neither fish nor fowl. I mean, it was a 50 micron core, so notionally, uh, you know, slightly better distances, but, but um, yeah, pretty much the same technology as OM1 and never really caught on. You know, you never really see it. OM3 has been around for about 10 years now, very widely used, you know, still widespread. I still see it being installed, although most installers have moved on to OM4, the current standard. Uh, and the thing about the different, you, know, you look at that, you know, 50 micron core, laser optimized glass, same for OM4. But, but OM4 uses this trick called um, graded index, um, where uh, rather than, if we go back to the, uh, that, that picture there, rather than the, 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 than the light modes sort of banging hard into the walls of the glass, uh, OM4 is a graded index fiber where the optical characteristic, the refractive index of the fiber varies across the diameter of the core such that the, the, the light is kind of slowed down and, and it doesn't bang hard into the wall of the glass. It's basically kind of sent down the, the, the pipe more as a wave than as a set of collisions with the side of the, of, of, of the fiber. And so, um, uh, you know, you can get about four times the distance out of OM4. You know, one and a half thousand meters, 2,000 meters at a pinch at 10 gigabits is, is very, you know, achievable for OM4. And of course, it's, it's, it's back compatible with OM3, you know, no worries. And so that, that, this tends to be the standard that we're installing now. And, you know, whereas, you know, back 10 years ago, OM3 was like three times the price of OM1. And so a lot of customers weren't happy with that. And so sort of like OM1 lingered a while. OM4 is now pennies more expensive than OM3 for all parts. And, and so it's the one we tend to install. It's, it's uh, much more, you know, kind of future proof, if you will. Um, as, as mentioned, uh, the limitations of, of multi-mode optics is that modal dispersion, this smearing of, of, the, of, of the wave as it travels down the, the cable, limits the, 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 the distance that multi-mode optics can go to. And, you know, those figures, 150, 650, was very typical for OM3. With, with OM4, graded index fibre, we can get a lot further. Uh, but, you know, we're, we're kind of limited data rate-wise as well. 10 gigabits per second is, is, is about where we top out this year. Um, uh, you know, whereas single mode, obviously, you know, the sky is the limit. Um, there's another multi-mode gotcha. As, as OM4 has become more common, um, 
uh, we've realized in testing um, uh, fiber installations, uh, you know, so, so OM4 has become very popular, and now we would expect a circuit to be sub two decibels of loss across, across you know, the, the, the circuit as we install it. Um, you know, 10 years ago when we were still installing OM1, 8 dBs, wow, that was just fine, you know. Point, point a blinking torch down the cable, and if you see a light at the other end, we're good to go. But nowadays, we use a calibrated laser, and we measure the response of each circuit, and you know, we're looking to be 2 dBs or better. And with a, with a modern uh, uh, core alignment machine, and, uh, and, and the king of the fiber, Wesley, you, we, we achieve that every time, you know, there's no, no, no trouble at all. Um, uh, but the other thing we come across uh, that people don't sort of like quite quite grasp is that if you mix and match OM1 with with OM3 or OM4 parts, you obviously have a, a core size mismatch when you when you jack that OM1 cable into an OM4 patch panel, or and and and, and you lose about two and a half dBs of, of performance when you do that. So you've already compromised more than what we would expect your circuit, and. You know, the great thing about most data standards is that they tolerate some error correction and recovery. TCP is fantastic at resending packets. And although you might get a green light on, on, on the fiber card and a green light on the switch, you'd never know if you were having to retransmit every 10th packet and with all the trouble that that brings you. The other thing that's become very obvious um, as, we've, as we're getting into OM4 is that when you test a, uh, a circuit to get an accurate figure, you have to avoid what they call encircled flux. When, when, when I showed you that picture of, of what a multi-mode uh, core looks like, you get the impression that actually no light travels down the, the, the cladding. It's not quite true. If you don't, if you don't, um, if you don't take care uh, with, the, with how you launch your test signal, some light does travel down the cladding, and we get this, this effect of encircled uh, flux, and so we get an uh, 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 unreliable reading at the other end as to how good that circuit is. And so there's several methods for avoiding that, but, but it's, it's, it's something that was never really an issue with OM3 and before, but it's something we have to worry about now. So different fibre connector types, and this is true between multi-mode and single mode. Uh, you know, uh, so I'd say the one, uh, LC, that's the one we deal with 90% of the time. But we still see F SC and ST a bit. FC, not so much. MPO is becoming very common. I say very common. It's becoming very common with people who have lots of money who can afford to run all their uh, REC 2022-6 infrastructure over 10 gig. Uh, so there's, we've got one customer in particular. And uh, uh, they use MPO for pretty much all their video patching because an MPO cable can carry, you know, it's eight fibers. and and so that can carry four 10 gig circuits over multi-mode, uh, which is equivalent of four SDIs in 2022-6 uncompressed 3G uh, land. And so if you could afford to build your facility based around Snell, you know, Sam, Snell and Wilcox and Arista, then, then you'll see lots of MPO in your facility, but not many people can. And so generally speaking, the LC connector is the one we see the most of, uh, with a little bit of SC and a little bit of ST, and not much of anything else. They also come in a, a variant, um, which uh, they come in a variant uh, where you get a green uh, um, plastic finishing piece, and that's called a, uh, an APC variant, and that's quite common with telcos. So sometimes you know, you'll you go and look at the, the the Soho Net or the BT termination in your machine room, and that will have maybe an SC connector but with a green surround on it. Uh, and, and that's the, the, uh, the, the APC, the angle polish connector variant. And basically what they do is, um, on one end of the, uh, on the receiver, uh, on, 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 the, on the, the thing you patch into, the end of the cable has been polished with, with kind of a dimple in it. And, and, and the cable you plug into that, which again has to be a green part, is polished with a dome on it. And so you get a better mating, but if you try and use standard non-APC parts with it, you get no signal whatsoever. That's quite, quite confusing the first time you come across it. But uh, if you see a green end, it has to be mated to a green end, even though it looks like the kind of connector you were expecting. Um, don't use the blue end to connect to it. So where's my guy, Wesley? Um, so Wes is now going to um, uh, run the splicer machine, and, and so he's already prepared the two ends of fiber that, that are going to be connected together. Um, the, the thing that um, we um, uh, say to people is that, uh, um, you know, you don't want to be running pre-made patch cords through your facility. You can buy them, you can buy 50 meter pre-made patch cords, but just because you can do something doesn't mean to say you should. Because a tight buffered cable, and here's a couple here, which you know, no doubt you're very familiar with, There's a, this is a turquoise one, so it's probably OM3, but you can't rely on the colour of the cable that much, there's lots of variation. Um, 
Uh, it's a pre-made, what we call a tight buffered cable. And tight buffered refers to the construction of the cable. It's how, how the fibres inside are adhered to the cladding and then adhered to the, the PVC jacket. It's probably not a PVC jacket, it's a low smoke jacket. Uh, and there's, there's, a, there's a single mode cable, you can tell because it's yellow, but again, you can't rely on the colours too much because they often aren't right. And this one is, uh, what is that? That's ST at one end and that's uh, LC at the other end. So the kind of pre-made pre -made, tight buffered patch cords you're very used to. They're great for patching from the wall box into the back of the workstation or from the switch into the back of the uh, drive array, something like that. Uh, but they're not man enough for running through ducts and under floors and such. And so here's a couple of show and tells. I want to hand these around. This is the kind of cable we recommend you run through ducts and under floors and such. This is called a loose tube cable. And in here, the actual glass fibers themselves aren't adhered to anything. They sit in this plastic pipe, which is full of a mineral oil, which means that one of the benefits of that is that this cable has a much better minimum bend radius. So you know with this kind of cable, if you kind of do that, you get massive losses and you risk damaging the cable. Uh, and in fact, the minimum bend radius on this cable is not great. Uh, whereas on this cable, because the fibers are able to slip and slide over each other within the oil bath, within the cable, uh, they enjoy a much better minimum bend radius specification than this kind of cable. The other joy of this cable is it's much tougher. So you've got the, the fibers in their mineral oil, in the plastic pipe, surrounded by a Kevlar armor, surrounded by a, um, a, 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 a low smoke zero halogen jacket. And this stuff is, is, is very tough. I've seen OB trucks drive over this without any damage at all. Um, and in fact, the only time we've ever had to go back and mend this is when somebody enthusiastically put a picture up on a cable riser that was kind of hidden behind a wall and the nail they put managed to get right through right into the cable and you think what are the chances of that happening but you know it happens so I don't, have a little look at these as I say the tight buffered cable um, you can see that the fiber is very tightly glued adhered to the inner, inner um, uh, jacket whereas this there is no adhering to the to the uh, to the fiber thank you but of course, if you're using um, a loose tube cable, infrastructure installation cable, um, how do you put the ends on? Well, this is, this is what, what Wes is going to show us now. So if I do that, and can you see the screen of Wes's machine? It's not, it's not great focus, is it? But um, uh, there we go. So, so what Wes has done is he's prepared the two ends of the fibre, he's put them into the machine, and the machine now is, is doing uh, its magic. And essentially, uh, previous generations of machines were what we call cladding alignment machines. They would align the, the two fibres to be spliced by the outward uh, uh, you know, limit of the fiber whereas this machine has cameras and we can see the two output of the two cameras there it can look up into the fiber and tell uh, uh, where the core is and, and is able then to, to align the cable both horizontally and vertically so the cores are perfectly matched to each other uh, and, uh, and, and, and some of the other benefits are the machine does all the um, uh, calculations of, 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 sort of distance and all those kind of things, whereas previously we'd have been looking down a microscope and adjusting verniers to do that manually. Um, you know, we did that for 10 years with the earlier generations of machines, but a machine like this, you can crack through you know, several times as many splices in an hour and several times as many panels in a day, you, you know, and you know, with all the economy that that brings, than you could with those earlier generations of machines. So hit the button, Wes, and see what happens when it connects those fibers together. So that's the, that's the splicing arc. And you can see now that the, 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 those two bits of cable are perfectly spliced together. And rather splendidly, we can't quite see, what does it say? What is, it's given us a reading for the? 0.0 dB. Right, okay, so it's the, the loss across that splice is so modest that the machine can't even measure it. So, so you know, this is, this is kind of nirvana. And you look how small this thing is. You could literally put that in your rucksack. Uh, not that we encourage that. They come in nice big padded cases. but. Um, you know, this is kind of the answer to, to the fibre installer's prayer sort of thing, this kind of machine. And, and you saw how quickly it did it. And uh, if Wesley now lifts the, uh, the, the cover, then uh, this is just the nicest thing. The machine does a pull test. It tugs the cable a little bit just to make sure nothing's gone on with the splice, you know, that it's perfect and ready to go. So now he can remove it from the machine. He can put it in the, in the little splice protect oven at the back of the machine that bakes on the protective splice protector. And now that's ready to be dressed into a panel or, or you know, uh, into a wall box or however else you want to do it. So here's a couple of examples of, of, of ways we've done things. So, so on, on the right there, you can see a very typical kind of uh, um, uh, Route 6 Jigsaw 24 wall box you might get. And positions 13 and 14 on that wall box, bottom left, are two duplex fibre outlets. Uh, and Neutrick do some very good um, 
uh, Neutric D-cutout mount connectors called optical cons, and in that situation, that's what we use. This is a this is a one-kilometer drum, and we made four of these for Arsenal one year, uh, and, uh, and and again we've got optical cons on the on the hub of the of the um, of, of the runout cable. So it's a very neat, you know, very robust way of doing it. And, and this cable here has done four, I think, FA Cup win winner weekends where they blink in. These are kilometre long and they pull them out and they run them all the way around the stadium so that that OB and that OB, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a very nice way of, of building um, a kit of parts. Yeah, we've already talked about this, the difference between a, a cladding alignment machine and a, a core alignment machine. You've just seen Wesley demo the, the IFS 15, which is our... Yeah, we have a couple of these machines, they're fantastic. Um, and uh, and, 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 and how, how that works under software control. And then there's, I had to put that up, it's, a, it's one of Wesley's panels. Um, uh, that's a 48-way panel, uh, and you can see the incoming fibres there. Uh, all the splice protectors are hidden underneath those bridges and, and then dressed onto the panel there. Now, I mean, the, the, the joy of this is that you know, if, if something goes wrong, you're, all you're into, into is replacing the, the drop cord that runs between the panel and the back of the equipment. If you ran in a 50 metre long patch cord between the back of the equipment and the edit suite, and that thing breaks, you know, you're into a whole night of blinking, pulling in a new cable. So, you know, for, for our money, for, for not much more money, uh, this is the kind of infrastructure wiring we, we encourage everybody to, 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 to shell out for, rather than just throwing in some pre-mades. Um, a little fault finding tip uh, which we use is if you get one of those laser pointers and you, and you point it into a fibre circuit, if there's any points along the circuit where the cable has been damaged within the jacket or even at the splice point, you can see the light spilling out of, the, of where the fault is. And a very quick and easy way of, <coughs> of detecting if, you've, if you have inadvertently damaged a splice fibre. Here's some photos taken uh, down a fibre microscope, you know, get against a little 100-pound part that we use to inspect the end of cable. Um, uh, and, and this is the result of um, working on a building site, essentially. So, so uh, this is what you get when you expose the end of fibre patch cords to a dusty environment. The dust just accumulates on the end of the fibre. So there's, there's the cladding there. And you can see, if you look hard, you can see the transmissive core in the centre of the fibre there. And in fact, that one's not so bad. But this one, you can see there's a blinking big bogey sitting on top of the transmissive core. And so that cable was giving like 10 dBs of loss or whatever. And then using just one of these little gadgets, and again, this is a very cheap little part. You, you, you open it, and there's a, a pre, um, uh, what would you say, like a pre-dosed um, isopropanol wipe there. And, and you just wipe the, the end of the fibre on that. And when you close it, like, a, like the hand towel in the gents, it, it moves on a bit. And, you know... If you've got fibre in your facility, you should really have a couple of these because this will this will save you from having to replace fibre patch cords often, and, and that's the result at the end. That was that one, and then one swipe of the cleat tops, and that's what it looks like. Again, not great photos because they're taken with an iPhone pointing down a microscope, uh, but uh, you know it shows the um, it shows the pr the principle. So now we need to turn our attention to single mode fibre. Single mode fibre was the original um, technology um, uh, and works in an entirely different way. Uh, uh, it uses a 9 micron transmissive core. It uh, doesn't rely on that total internal reflection nonsense that bedevils uh, multi mode cable. Much higher data rates uh, and, and much higher distances. So typically 80 kilometres without amplification. Um, you, can, you can send uh, you know, uh, single mode fibre. And if, if you look at, um, if you get some SFPs and you look at a single mode SFP, it will say on it how far it will go. And the standards are typically 20, 40, and 80 kilometres. Um, and it tickles me that people refer to short-range single-mode SFPs. I'm not sure that 20 kilometres is a short range, but um, uh, that's, that's what people say. And that all comes down to the fact that it's, it's all down to signal-to-noise ratio. These things have all got auto-gain-correcting amplifiers on their optical inputs. And, and so really, when you talk about signal level, actually, you're talking about signal-to-noise ratio. And so 28 dBs is, is the signal-to-noise ratio we expect for a circuit that can carry to 80 kilometres. And when you think about you know, the sort of loss figures we would tolerate with with multi-mode cable, 28 dBs is blinking huge, isn't it? Um, this is a technology that has much wider applications in video and data. All the, all the um, uh, 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 SMPT 297-2006 uh, um, um, 
video fibre devices, uh, expect to see a single mode cable. Um, if you're doing uh, in inter area or inter building or to your data center um, uh, data, then it's a single mode fibre, it has to be, you know, multi mode wouldn't do. And, and the real magic is that multiplexing is possible. Um, uh, we'll talk about that much more in December, but with multiplexing, you can stick many, many wavelengths down a single cable. It's not the same as multi mode cable, where you're using interference patterns to generate multiple modes down a cable, but it's, it's many, many wavelengths of light none of which talk to each other, uh, and it's like you're reusing your fibre many, many times. So, just coming into the end now, um, here's a bit of further reading. Um, yeah, I mean, there's stuff on, on, on our blog, and, and I've, I bang on endlessly uh, on, on my blog. Uh, the Next Sands uh, Cable the Future magazine is really quite good. For a trade publication, it's really worth reading. Uh, it's got lots of good, hard technical stuff inside, and uh, generally speaking, you know, as Cat8 was coming along, we found about it in here. Uh, you know, when OM4 became a thing, we found out about it by reading this. And so it's a, it's, it's a rare example of a, of a, of a, um, a trade publication that's actually worth reading, the Next Sand Cable of Future magazine. And so um, apart from any questions you might have, that's, that's it. Now, I've told you all I can tell you for today. Um, uh, come and have a little squint at the machine and, uh, and, 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 uh, and, and see, you know, if you, if you want us to come to your facility and splice fibres, this is the kind of thing we'll bring with us. Um, but really, just um, any, uh, any questions, now's the time. <laughs>